Welcome to episode 211 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Duncan Falconer. He's an ex-military guy, a novelist, and a screenwriter. He recently did an action film called Stratton, which is based on a series of novels he also wrote. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find these episodes valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Over on iTunes, I want to thank Henry J 56 who left me a very nice review. Thank you very much for that review. It is very much appreciated. If you do have a minute, please do go to iTunes and leave some feedback. If there's a comment you want to make to me that you don't want to be public, that's fine too. You can just email me at info at sellingyourscreenplay.com. I really have no way of knowing what aspects of the podcast people like and what they don't like, so any and all feedback is very much appreciated. These iTunes reviews really are helpful. It helps get the podcast listed in more places in iTunes so it reaches a broader audience. Also, if you subscribe in iTunes to the podcast, you'll get the new episodes downloaded to your phone each week automatically. So that's a nice way to stay current on the podcast. Anyway, thanks again to Henry J 56 for that very nice review. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast and then just look for episode number 211. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a whole bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. I just want to quickly mention the writers group that I'm in. We're always looking to add good writers to the rotation. We meet every Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. until about 10 p.m. in Sherman Oaks, California, which is right around where the 405 and 101 freeways intersect. Here's how it works. Each week, three member writers put up around 25 pages of a screenplay they're currently working on. The pages are read on stage by professional actors in front of the other writers in the group. And then the listening writers give notes to the presenting writers. As a member writer, you'll be putting up pages about every five weeks. It's a great way to workshop your material, network with other talented actors and writers, and hone your critical thinking skills by giving notes to other writers. This is a live in-person event, so you need to live somewhere near Sherman Oaks, California to be able to attend weekly. If you're not in the Los Angeles area, perhaps consider starting a writer's group of your own in your local area. The one big stumbling block for people and this group is that you have to be committed to showing up nearly every Tuesday, even when you're not up, so that you can give notes to the other writers who are presenting that week. If you'd like to learn more about the group, go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash writers group, and the word writers group is all lowercase and all one word, and of course I will link to it in the show notes. Quick few words about what I'm working on. So once again, the main thing I'm working on writing wise is the kids television show I've been talking about the last couple of months. I'm working on episode number three right now and the plan is to shoot four episodes for the first initial season. So I have one more to write after this one is finished. There'll definitely be some rewriting and re reworking as once I get those four episodes done. But um, I'm pretty, pretty into episode three now. So I would say another week or two on episode three and then hopefully by, you know, middle or end of February, I'll be done with episode four and then I'll start doing some tweaks and rewriting. So last week I went to Vegas to meet with the two, with the two producers and the main actor of this show. I've never been involved in the business side of things quite as much um, as I am in this. And I wouldn't even say I'm involved, but I'm very um, friendly with the producers. And so, you know, I'm at least sort of privy to the discussions that they're having that's on the business side. And it's just interesting to kind of hear those discussions. Um, as I said, when I've sold scripts in the past to producers, usually you sell the script and, you know, you're not necessarily involved in 
really anything other than sort of the story and the screenplay. Um, but in this case, you know, I'm just getting to know these producers in these types of meetings on the phone. We've had a number of conference calls and I'm just hearing them talk about the various business side of things. I find it fascinating. I mean, there's just a ton of business stuff that needs to happen for something like this to take off. Obviously, they're raising money, but there's a lot of business things they have to get in sort of in place um, so that they can ensure that their investor has a good chance of recouping his money. And that means, you know, cutting some sort of a deal with a TV network, maybe doing some sales overseas, uh, trying to sell the, the TV rights to some foreign countries. The producers have high hopes for this. I mean, this is a kid's TV show. There's, you know, dogs and cats, trained dogs and cats in it. Um, so it's a very kind of, you know, family friendly kids show that I think, you know, could travel well. It is a sort of a comedy, but um, the comedy is very broad with animals and sort of physical humor. So the producers have high hopes that they will be able to um, to sell it outside of the U.S. So they're trying to start arrange some of those meetings and potentially pre-sell that stuff. So just a lot of business stuff that goes on. Now, all that to say that, um, you know, during these two days in Vegas, there was not a lot of discussion sort of about the script and story, which is fine by me because I'm, you know, the one handling that. And, um, you know, the more notes you get, it's it makes it more difficult, especially with, you know, we have an actor and then these two producers. But um, so far, been very little. Obviously, the main actor, that was really our discussion the actor and myself, we were really discussing sort of more of the story stuff while these two producers were more sort of interested in the business side of things. Um, and I'll just give you an example. All these sorts of things, these these business decisions that they're making. One good example is... Um, you know, one of the producers is looking on some investment from China. Um, they think, again, that this, this show could potentially play in China. China is a, you know, growing market. Um, so they're, they're basically their note is, hey, can you write in? There's two kids in the show two main kids, can you make one of the kids friends, a Chinese kid, and then we can, you know, have him in there. And that should hopefully open some doors to this Chinese investment, because obviously the people in China, they like to see something that they can relate to as well. Um, so those are the sorts of practical notes that I kind of came away with, not so much story notes or character notes, dialogue notes, you know, nothing like that. Um, so anyways, it was an interesting trip. And um, I think the project is moving along. So any event, my fingers are crossed and hopefully they'll be able to raise the money and we'll be able to shoot it. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer Duncan Falconer. Here is the interview. Welcome Duncan to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Hey, thanks for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you ultimately um, end up in the entertainment business? Uh, whew, right. Briefly, how long have we got? Thirty seconds. Yeah, the two minute. The two minute um, yeah, the two minute sort of elevator pitch. <laughs> uh, started in London, um, but orphaned out. Uh, grew up on the rough side of, of the city. Um, couldn't wait to get out. Um, wanted to be an engineer or something like that. And um, but uh, in in my day, the UK economy was in in the bin, and so the only way to get out was to join the military for a few years. So that was the plan. Uh, I joined the military, and they wanted to. As soon as I did my basic training, they wanted to make me um, a pen pusher, a clerk, and uh, I panicked and said I wanted to be special forces. Never even heard of special forces, really. <laughs> And uh, but next thing I knew, I found myself on a on a selection course, and somehow I, uh, out of 150 guys, I got through. There was about nine of us, and so I embarked on a career in special forces. And after about 12 years of that, um, I came out and got involved in private stuff, which was quite interesting for someone of my background military intelligence and all that sort of thing. And uh, I was heading over to South America to get involved in kidnap and ransom, which was quite a big trade in those days. And uh, I stopped off in Los Angeles uh, for a couple of months, just hanging out, um, wrote a screenplay, which I understand was mandatory for anyone arriving in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, no if you actually haven't got one. Yeah, you know, you get asked when you arrive, if, how's your screenplay coming? Uh -huh. So I started writing the screenplay, and um, to my shock and horror, um, Warner Brothers bought it. And um, and I, I thought, hey, this is fun. And, uh, of course, never found it quite that easy for a few years. But um, but that's how I got in the entertainment industry. Perfect. And what was that original screenplay about? Was that similar? Was it based on your background in um, the military? Yeah, it was called The Killing House. Um, it was, um, and it was about 
special forces, uh, you know, a kind of a new team. It never got made. It got chopped up. I saw it in a, bits and pieces in a few f- films. Um, I, I had some great ideas, but I, I wasn't obviously good enough to to, um, to sort of get picked up or lucky enough or whatever um, yeah. on that on that occasion. So we're gonna but, uh, yeah. we're gonna dig into your movie Stratton, and I wonder if you can give us a little bit of background on that. Kind of how did you move into writing novels? It sounds like your first foray into um, into writing was this sale of a screenplay. Had you written some novels before that point? Was that before and after? Maybe just to bring us up to date on your novel writing. Um, well, I, I, I spent 15 years in Los Angeles, wrote quite a few movies under a different name, um, a TV show under a different name, uh, Pacific Blue, ran for five years. That was one of my creations. Hmm. And, um, and then I was asked to, to write my biography, my autobiography, um, because I had quite an interesting um, career in Special Forces. I was the youngest Special Forces guy ever in the UK, and I had a very interesting time because um, because I was a neophyte when I joined. I didn't know anything. I was a schoolboy. I got sent to um, some uh, immediately to operational areas, and they kind of forgot about me. And I spent my first five years in um, high octane operational areas, and I sort of emerged from that in my twenties as quite an experienced um, uh, operator. I um, so that was the, the 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 basics of my novel. Which uh, sorry my biography which was called first interaction and um the publishers uh, kind of liked it and so they came back to me and said um would would you fancy writing um a fiction and so uh i never even dreamed of writing a fiction book but there you go I, and i embarked and i and i ended up writing nine of them huh. yeah. and so did you have that experience when you arrived in la and, and sold the killing house had you started to write some of these fictional novels no, the only thing I'd ever written by, when I got to L.A. was operational reports, you know, technical attacks. Nice. I mean, never written two burn, never, I told a few tall stories in my time, but never put <laughs> anything on paper. And I'm curious, you, you made the remark earlier in the interview that they wanted to turn you into a pen pusher. Did the people in the military, did they see that you were a very good writer, like you were exceptional at this, and so it was more of something that they saw a talent in you? Or did you, because the way you said it, it sounded like they were kind of trying to, you know, push you off in that direction where you didn't necessarily want to go. But I wonder if someone recognized mm. that you did have a talent for writing. No, unfortunately not. No, I mean, when you join the military, you know, someone like the Marines, I mean, the, 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 there's one officer whose job is to fill all the, the slots for cooks, for drivers, for pen pushers, clerks. No. And so they randomly chose people for those jobs. So no, nothing, nothing quite so grand. They didn't even know I could write. I didn't know I could write. No one knew I could write. I see. Okay, so let's dig into um, your current film, Stratton, starring um, Dominic Cooper. Um, maybe you can give us a pitch or log line. What's that film all about? Uh, well, it's, uh, it was supposed... It, it, it kind of evolved in, in many different directions, but it, was, um, it, it became a sort of like... It's a story about a special forces guy who is special forces, and you kind of need to know, I guess... Uh, I wanted to try and introduce that uh, Special Forces and Undercover Operations, MI6, James Bond, these are all completely different categories. And so my character, Stratton, he's he's a guy who, one of the rare people, and this is based on truth, he's a rare Special Forces operator that made the jump into the more um, MI5, MI6, Bondian type hmm. um operational areas which are all real i mean i know bond is uh, is very fictionalized but it's based on, on on fact and and so a lot of my stuff is too so stratton is a guy that is special forces but because of his unique abilities a bit of luck being in the right place at the right time um he he ends up ca- coming under the eye of mi6 and mi5 and he then starts getting drawn into those operations and that's what this story was essentially about. It's a guy that tries, that, that makes the jump into, um, into uh, SIS type stuff. I see. Perfect. So let's talk about these novels. Now, it's, um, you just mentioned that you've written nine novels. Are all of those novels, do they have this same Stratton character in those novels, or some of them do, some of them don't? No, I started off the first couple. Um, when I was writing them, um, I, when I came after 9/11, I jumped back into uh, into this world of um, of high octane operations, and 
I went straight to Iraq and Afghanistan, and um, I took a job taking a high-profile media characters from CNN, Fox News, people like that, in, who wanted to go into really dangerous uh, areas. And so I would take them in, plan their ops, and um, get them out without uh, losing them or, or, or myself, which I managed to do for 15 years. Um, never lost anybody. Well, okay, there was one guy who was slightly mauled. But, um, <laughs> and then I... Um, but... So, what, so while I was there, I was writing these Stratton stories. But one of my stories, I decided to write about, um, about what I was doing there. It was a fictional story. It was based on a guy I knew who found a million bucks in a tin can in, uh, in, in Iraq. And um, I tried to get it out of the country. So it was one of those type of stories. But otherwise, all the others are based on Stratton. Okay. And so let's talk about that move from you've got these novels out there. Um, they're selling out in the marketplace. Um, how did you make that leap? Did you pitch the project as a film to some of your film contacts? Or did someone, you know, a producer read the book and then contact you and say, hey, let's turn this into a movie? Yeah, it's the latter. Um, American producer, um, uh, just uh, like my books, uh, she came along and said, uh, hey, let's do a movie together. Uh, I wrote the screenplay, um, and you went through the process of the, you know, the film process, um, went to find money, and then went to find a star, and went to find a director, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and as you know, it's a, uh, you just got to fall down on one of those hurdles, and, uh, and the film doesn't get made. But um, somehow, I keep we kept managing to jump one obstacle over the uh, after another, and, uh, and and bingo, we got the movie made. Yeah, it wasn't easy. It was it was tough, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, we 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 got it done. I'm, and I'm curious, with your background writing for film and TV, why didn't you ever think about pitching these uh, these novels as as film projects? I, I, well, I did actually. I, I, I like I had a lot of friends in LA. By the time I um, you know I spent a lot of time there. I mean I. I knew a lot of characters, Dick Donner and Lawrence Schuler, and God, I can go through a whole list of people that I sort of knew. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I did actually spend a lot of time in the studios pitching projects um, and got a lot of airtime with some very high-profile people, but uh, nothing ever seemed to stick. It's a tough business, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it seemed it was strange that I, I then left Hollywood, went back to the war zones, um, and started writing books, and it's the books that seemed to get um, m me attraction, uh, m you know, uh, attracted me back into the film industry, if you like. Yeah. So I just want to touch on your writing process a little bit, and um, we can sort of open it with screenwriting, but I'd be curious to kind of get the same answers, um, you know, screenplay versus writing a novel. How much time do you spend preparing to write? Um, in other words, in that sort of outlining, mulling things over stage, how much time is spent there versus how much time is spent actually opening up final draft or opening up word, I guess, in the case of a novel and actually doing the actual writing? But I believe that nearly most of the work is done in the preparation and is in the synopsis. Um, I, I, I don't believe in starting the, the the book or the screenplay uh, until the, the the synopsis is really singing, and so that's that's where it happens. And, for, and the synopsis for me just gets bigger and bigger until it's almost the book or the screenplay without the dialogue, almost. You know, and in fact, if you get some good ideas with dialogue, you throw it in there. Yeah. Um, it's got to work. It's got to be tight. That's where you. That's where you. You make all your mistakes. That's where you. That's where you. You refine the plot so that when you actually then begin the book or the screenplay. It, it, then it's just a run. Then you, mm -hmm. then you just really can enjoy yourself, and then it's a case of just writing and polishing, and writing and polishing. Yeah. So what are we talking? That's about? my talking process. About, anyway. Is that outlining stage usually three months, six months, a year? What does that usually look like for you? Oh, it doesn't work that long for me. I um, uh, mainly because uh, well, one of the rules about writing, as far as I'm concerned, is write about what you know. So it, it's a lot easier if I was going to. Im write a, a book on landing on the moon, you know, it's probably going to take me about a year to, you know, <laughs> to just sit down and do some research. Because I'm writing about things I know a great deal about, um, it, it, it cuts down a lot of time. So, um, so I would like to spend a couple of months, three months maybe, doing the synopsis stage, um, uh, finalizing it, you know, and, and then you've got story problems, story obstacles, which you need to overcome. You know, one of the techniques of writing is obviously, because you don't want to be predictable, get yourself in situations that you can't figure how you're going to get out of it. And then you've got to figure out how you're going to get out of it. And sometimes that can take 
days or weeks or months even. Yeah, for sure. And so um, what do your days look like when you're actually in that writing zone? Is it, um, do you write for a couple hours a day and then work on other projects? Do you write for 12 hours a day during those three months that you're outlining? What do those days look like? Well, I, I'm, I always like to keep busy, so I don't want to just write. So I'm, I'm still actually in the game a bit, uh, in the, um, you know, in, in the conflict zone game, not so much on the ground. Uh, I do a lot of planning and operational stuff. So I do tend to split my days up. So I, um, I mean, I, I do a lot of crisis management for companies, um, and, and I actually am a responder for some big companies. I was involved in a crisis a couple of years ago in Iraq where I go out and I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I plan the, the rescue of 200 people who were caught behind ISIS enemy lines. And so I still do that sort of stuff, and I like to put my writing in in between. So sometimes I might, be, might not be able to work for a few days, but then I'll suddenly be stuck in a hotel for a week waiting and that's perfect writing time for me so that there's no formula for me in that respect i uh because i still try and keep busy i gotta mix the two and i get told off i'm quite often late for write um, with my pr product i mean my publisher was always pulling his hair out because i i'd, I'd look like i was going to be on time and then suddenly i'm like two months late because mm -hmm. you know something broke ebola broke out in uh, liberia you know and yeah. so i got stuck yeah. Sorry to cut in. We have uh, one minute left. Perfect. No problem. Um, so how can people see Stratton? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? No, I don't, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, I talk, to, I talk a bit, quite a bit to the uh, GFM, the, um, um, I'm, I'm, uh, the financiers. I'm good friends with them. And, and, uh, but uh, I, I, I don't actually, to be honest, take a, a lot of notice about that stuff. I'm working on a new trilogy now, uh, a, a Stratton trilogy. A really exciting new project, and, uh, and my head's really kind of stuck in there at the moment. Yep, yeah, no problem at all. And what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Um, Twitter, Facebook, blog, anything you're comfortable sharing. Um, I will round that stuff up and put it in the Yeah, I got a Facebook. I got a Duncan Falk in the Facebook, and um, um, you know, I try and keep people updated on that. Perfect. I, I should be better, I know, but uh, sometimes when I go a lot of places, I can't get a connection anyway, you know. Yeah. Uh, Stuck, stuck in some hole in the, in, on the planet. Uh, it's tough getting a connection, you know. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Well, Duncan, I really appreciate your time. Um, I wish you luck with this with this film and um, and your next projects as well. I just want to mention a brand new service that I recently launched here at Selling Your Screenplay. I built the SYS Select Screenplay Database. Screenwriters up, upload their screenplays along with a logline, synopsis, and other pertinent information like budget and genre, and then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays that they want to produce. I'm adding features to this nearly every day, so ultimately it will be the hub for all SYS Select services. If you're a member of SYS Select already, you should have access to it and have your login information. If you don't, email me. I'm happy to get that to you. I've already got dozens of producers in the system looking for screenplays. Screenplays are getting viewed, are getting downloaded. Um, as I said, um, I think last week, um, I've already sort of heard that um, some producers have contacted some writers and there's some negotiations going on there, so it seems to be working nicely. To learn more about this, you can go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. And when you join SYS Select, you get access to the brand new screenplay da database along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members. Those services include the monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in that monthly newsletter. Also, screenwriting leads. We um, have partnered with one of the premier screenwrite, paid screenwriting leads services so that I can syndicate those leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, I've been getting five to 10 high quality paid leads per week. These are producers and production companies who are actively looking to buy material or who are looking to hire a screenwriter for a specific project. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. These leads run the gamut from production companies looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. Producers are looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots. It's a huge array of different types of projects that these producers are looking for, and these leads are exclusive to our partner and SYS Select members.
Also, you get access to the SYS Select Forum where we help, we'll, we will help you with your logline and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. Also in the forum is our, all the recorded screenwriting classes that I've done over the years, so you'll get access to all of those as well. You can learn more about those classes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash online dash classes. I will link to that in the show notes as well. Once again, if this sounds like something that you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. I had an email exchange last week with a screenwriter who was wondering about the stats they're seeing with their screenplay that they have loaded into the database. Basically, he was wondering, he's, he, inside of the database, you can see how many logline views, how many script info views, how many screenplay downloads you've gotten as a screenwriter. You can see that information about your own scripts. So he was wondering, he had a bunch of, of logline views, but no downloads, and he was wondering what was typical, what, what a typical... What do people typically see from logline views to actual downloads? Um, at some point, I will make a video so that writers can see what the producers see, um, just to give you a little more insight into how the whole process works. But for now, I'll just kind of give a quick overview. So basically, and it seems pretty intuitive, but I'll just describe it here. Basically, a producer logs into SYS Select, and they can then go to the screenplay search page, and they can use a variety of search criteria like genre, budget, maybe even scripts that have won contests, um, you know, scripts that maybe have placed highly in the SYS way a script analysis service there's a whole bunch of criteria that they can look through and then they hit the search button and then they'll get a bunch of results um, printed out to them every script that gets returned in the results gets a logline view basically they the producer sees a list of the writer's name along with the logline of each script that gets returned in the search results so each one of those those search results returns a logline view for each one of the scripts that show up now if the producer likes the log Line, they read the log line and they like it they can click a button that says more script information and that will give them a synopsis for the script and a whole bunch of other information that um, the writer might have written about specifically about the script then if they still like what they see they read the synopsis they like whatever the writer has has written about the script then if they like that they can click another button that says download the full script so you have log line views and then you have script info views and then obviously script downloads that's kind of the progression of of, of how a producer is going to go through the site. There's one little caveat. The producers can also, once they're looking at the search results, they can also click a link that says writer's info, and that will pop up some sort of general information about that writer, including a log line for each log line that that writer has. So say the writer has three or four law scripts in the SYS select database then when the producer clicks writer info they will then see all four of those log lines and of course they can drill down into that and actually get a um, this more script info and then potentially download the scripts so if you're using SYS select and you're wondering what writer info views that's what those are that's when someone has actually clicked just to learn a little bit more about the writer but maybe not specifically about that script the writer's info, at least for the, the, the conversation that, we're, that I'm having right now, the writer info view isn't really that important, but that's what that is. Okay, so all of these view, all of this view info, again, it's available to you if you're a writer in the SYS Select system. You just go in there, you can click, click a button, and you will see all of these views listed, and you'll see the companies that have viewed the log lines and potentially downloaded the script. So basically what this writer was asking is, you know, if I get 10 logline views how many downloads should I get and this is a very reasonable question and it was one that I was interested in trying to find out myself now before I start talking about these specific actual numbers that I'm going to give about SYS the SYS select database one word of warning there are a number of other similar services out there similar to SYS select where you upload a script and producers can search for it I've never used any of those other services as a producer I've used many of them as a screenwriter but never as a producer so I don't know exactly how the producers are viewing the information and I also don't know how those services are counting logline views and that's all of that to say that the numbers I'm about to talk about for the SYS select database they may not be applicable to these other services because these other services are just different in how they lay they're laid out and they're different in how they might potentially um, calculate the logline views and the script downloads so I don't think you can extrapolate the numbers I'm about to give you to these other services I just don't know maybe you can maybe you can't it's hard to say anyways 
in terms of my own service, here's what I'm seeing. Roughly speaking, for each logline view that you get, about 3% of those logline views are resulting in a producer actually clicking all the way through and getting to the button and clicking the download screenplay. So make the math easy. If you get 100 logline views, you should see roughly three downloaded screenplays. So if you're seeing numbers that are lower than that, you might consider rewriting your logline. Now this might seem like a very low percentage, but keep in mind the logline views are just a view of the logline from the search results. That's all it is. So um, you know, producers are doing lots of searches. They're looking for the for the loglines, and you know they're just scanning through them. So it stands to reason that you're going to have a lot more logline views than actual script downloads. Now, interestingly, from logline views to um, or yeah, from logline views to script info view. So again, keep in mind, the producers do a search, they see a bunch of log lines, they're then clicking on the button that says, you know, more script screenplay info. They're clicking on that. That was about 6.7% of the time. So if you see, a, again, to make the math easy, if you get 100 log line views, roughly speaking, almost 7% of the time, the producer should be clicking to the, um, the more script info. So this is how you can start to tell if your log line is effective or not. Now, what I thought was interesting about that log line view to script info views, and then to um, ultimately to the downloads, the it's almost 50%, a little bit less, let's say 42%, the 6.7% is it's a little more than double of the 3%. So maybe 40%, you know, 42%, something like that um, of the time when you get a log line view and you get to the script view, once the producer gets to that script info view, almost 50%, 42% of the time, they're actually going to download the script. And to me, I, this surprised me, and I thought that that was very interesting. I would have expected a lot more script info views where, because the synopsis is there. If they want to read the synopsis, they have to look at that script info. And I would have thought producers would be more interested in looking, oh, that sounds like an interesting logline. Let's read the synopsis. Look at the synopsis, say, yeah, no, thanks. But it's almost 50%. And what that indicates to me is that, again, I'm surprised by this, but what that indicates to me that um, the logline is just so, so important because if you can hook them with the logline, you've got almost a 50% chance of them actually downloading the screenplay. Now again, I would look at your specific numbers and see where you are at with all of this. The other thing that really occurs to me is that different genres are going to be different. So, and this is early in the stage. I mean, this, the SYS select database, it's only been around now for a little over a month. Really it was late December. We're, you know, at the end now of January, um, when I launched it. So maybe it's like six weeks, seven weeks old. So there's still not a lot of stats. These stats may not be um, statistically significant, but I do thought, I do think that they were interesting and, and just wanted to point them out to people. But again, I do want to emphasize that different genres could be different. Um, you know, you could be seeing more downloads in specific genres. You could be some more seeing more logline views. So at some point, it's a little more difficult. Um, I've got to like actually write some code to be able to figure out by genre these types of stats. Um, it was easy for me to just kind of do a quick analysis of all logline views, all screenplay downloads. So that's kind of what I did today. But um, I would say don't get too freaked out if your numbers are not matching up to these. But maybe think about it. Maybe rewrite your logline if you're not seeing the logline views ultimately at 3% get to down, get to screenplay downloads. And same thing if your log line is not getting, you know, 6.7, almost 7% of the time getting to that script info, maybe rewrite the log line. And then if your script info is not getting the downloads, perhaps rewrite the synopsis, perhaps rewrite the other information about that script. Um, it might, it might help a little bit. Anyway, I thought this was interesting and worth sharing. Hopefully you'll think it's interesting as well. Anyway, the, um, this stuff is, if you find this stuff super boring, please do email me. Um, you know, some people are probably not into this type of stuff. And again, I just have no way of knowing what people find interesting and not interesting. If you find this sort of stuff interesting, just, you know, drop me a tweet or, or send me an email info at selling your Say, Hey, yeah, I found that interesting. Or if you don't, um, you know, just send me, Hey, you know, that found that stuff kind of boring. Um, cause again, I can, I can continue to analyze these numbers and I can continue to talk about them on the podcast, but if people think it's boring, I'm happy to not talk about them as well. 
Anyway, so on the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Canadian writer Jason Philotrot. He just did a cool indie film called Entanglement, and we talked through that pro through that process as well as how he got his start in the business. And all of his writing has really been done in Canada. He broke into the industry in Canada, and he wrote this current film in Canada, and um, you know had networked and and met a Canadian director for it. So it's a great um, a great sort of inspiring story if you don't live in Hollywood on how you can um, potentially make things happen for yourself. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.